Hey, so I started this whole thing because I wanted to do my part to equip churches that might not have all the resources that would be ideal to navigate these present times at hand, especially in the United Methodist Church, as a lot of local churches are looking at disaffiliation. Those doors have already closed for a lot of people. There are just a lot of things to think about and examine and, and look through. I'm, I'm pretty conservative, and so I've intentionally sought to portray things from a, an unapologetic, uh, conservative, traditionalist Christian worldview. And I feel pretty good about the work that I've done. I've done a lot of uh, reports on annual conferences and interviews, and I'm going to keep doing stuff like that. But um, some of the other stuff that I've done has been more personal and just uh, one guy's view uh, and experience within the United Methodist Church. One of the things that I notice really uh, scaring, intimidating a lot of people is the authority of the conference structure, in particular the bishop. And I've talked a lot about um, the ways in which the power structure of the United Methodist Church mirrors worldly power structures. And I've been pretty clear scripturally that Jesus is, is very clear that that um, the church is not supposed to resemble the world and how it, you know, it, it, we are supposed to carry authority, uh, the clergy and leadership of the church. Even so, the authority we carry should be used in the same way that Jesus did, who could have called 10,000 angels down uh, and chose instead to, to suffer and die at the hands of sinners. So all that to say, um, I, I've been pretty against how it is that Episcopal power and authority is currently used in the United Methodist Church. I don't think I'm <laughs> unique in that at all. But the particulars of how it is that um, the Episcopacy bishops should operate, um, it, it's a worthy conversation, not just for correcting course in the United Methodist Church, which I do hope happens, but also within the Global Methodist Church as they continue forward, uh, an ecclesiology that has bishops. Uh, how is it that the bishop's authority should operate? Um, how is it that local churches and clergy should be in relationship with bishops and the cabinet um, that that carry authority in the area? This this is uh, <laughs> it's it's a big topic, and I can only address it from my particular angle. Um, so essentially, this 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 segment right here is going to be me reporting on an encounter I had with my own former bishop, Jimmy Nunn, in the Oklahoma Annual Conference. Um, just at the outset, I, I don't bear ill will towards him or most of the cabinet. I do think he has a couple DSs that are very ideologically compromised, and um, it's hard to see how it is that they could know Jesus, but that's between them. In Jesus, uh, so I'm not making statements as to their personal faith, but I, I do want to recount what happened about a year ago when I started off plain spoken, um, the the kind of attention that I got from them, and the hopefully the wisdom that I got from such a situation. The problem is, you know, it's an unpleasant memory, so I haven't thought a lot about it. I will say at the front end, I did record the whole encounter, um, which a lot of people would consider to be a no no, but. Um, I, I don't feel bad about it. If you saw my interview with, oh, heck, what was that guy's name? The, the guy in the Missouri Synod Lutheran Church, his uh, turnip seed, Ryan Turnipseed, he also recorded these encounters behind closed doors, and it's only because of his recording that he was able to substantiate the claims that he made. Otherwise, nobody would believe that people in church leadership could say and believe the things that they do. I'm not going to tell you a whole bunch of scandalous. I mean, I think they're unfortunate, but I mean, they weren't dropping F-bombs or anything. But there were some things said behind closed doors to me that I just thought were really emblematic of, of the state of the United Methodist Church. And the uh, I would use the words incompetence uh, that that is elevated in the institution as well as kind of the unscrupulous nature of a lot of the, the leaders. Um, I've said it. In a few other segments, and I want to say it again, that my district superintendent at the time, Terry Cohen, uh, I never experienced him to be inappropriate or unintelligent or not conscientious. I, I have nothing but good things to say about Terry. He was a part of this episode because of the virtue of, of his office. However, uh, I mean, I, he never said anything to me indicating he was in a different place from the bishop, but I've chosen to believe that uh, that whether or not he's on board with the bishop, he's just chosen to 
serve with integrity in the position that he's in. So I, I have absolutely nothing to, negative to say about him in any capacity. Now, with, with the bishop and a lot of his cabinet, I, I am disappointed in, in what's happened. Um, bishop Jimmy Nunn was nominated and elected by people who were under the very clear impression that he had um, a, a strong biblical theology, that he was of a conservative disposition, and that his primary loyalty was to Christ Jesus as known through the scriptures and not to the institution or making room for everybody or elevating um, liberal progressives to positions of authority. What's happened since he got into office is quite different from what was expected. Um, he immediately allowed himself to be courted by uh, not just centrist but far-left liberals. He uh, uh, refused to um, discipline those who were in clear violation of the discipline. He's leaned a whole lot on confidentiality and secrecy. Um, and he continued to elevate people into the district superintendent's position that were either hostile to right-leaning churches and people or were cowed by um, uh, vehement uh, left-leaning people. So there are DSs that lean right um, um, among his cabinet. However, they have their position has been made very clear to them, and they've been put in very compromising positions where – I've had to wonder how it is that they've maintained, you know, and once again, that's that's something between them and Jesus. Um, if you saw my recent interview with Lonnie Brooks, Lonnie is under the clear impression that the, the institution has behaved unconscionably, and even so, he's been able to hold on to it for reasons I, I don't really understand, but he's not alone in that. There are a number of people who have seen a number of uh, really bad things take place, and yet they're still loyal to the United Methodist Church. And to a degree, you always have to be gracious in any institution that you're a part of. No institution is going to be perfect. However, at a certain point, I got very clear that the United Methodist Church is um, doing more harm than good, that it is, uh, that it is a, a pattern of behavior on an institutional level that shows just a lack of awareness of who Christ is and who he calls us to be, a love of the world that... Um, it excludes them from right relationship with Christ Jesus. These are very serious uh, things that I'm laying at the doorstep of the United Methodist Church. I don't, I don't think they have bad intentions. I don't think anyone in authority has bad intentions. However, I think many of them have a very warped understanding of. Uh, I think it it all comes down to scriptural authority, honestly. But um, the the Jesus that they serve is just a really different Jesus than mine. Um, so anyway. About a year ago, I started this plain spoken podcast. I'm, I'm getting into the story now. And I was, I was not clear on the format that I wanted to do, but I, there are a number of people in my own annual conference that have good stories, personal stories, uh, uh, testimonials, and I, I called on different ones of them to talk about different issues, some of them pertaining to our own annual conference, some of them broader. It was kind of more of a news show. I was, I was looking at... Um, some other models on YouTube that I really liked, and I, I honestly still kind of like. I'd, I'd love to do that, but I didn't have the muscle for it. Anyway, I called on one clergy woman, uh, and you know, I, I I invited her to come back and do kind of a post mortem with me. And she's got a new appointment that you know she's looking forward. She's not looking backward. Um, I'm doing this not because I want to look backward and and s stir the pot. I'm doing this. Here's where I started because there are a lot of people who are very intimidated by the office of bishop and what the bishop can do to you to hurt you if you step out of line. And I, if you've seen my Bitter Medicine series, you know I don't think much of conservative clergy in particular who are cowed by the nastiness of centrists and progressives. I think it is for such a time as this that you have to witness to who Christ is and who he calls us to be. And if you're not willing to pay with your job, then I, I think you need to find a different profession because people who are in this just as a profession, just as a source of income and a pension, that, that is not what Christ modeled in his ministry. So I, I rebuke you and I, I call you to either step up or step out because this, this milk toast, middle of the road, only going to speak firmly about Jesus if I don't get in trouble for it is not a good witness. So uh, that's probably the harshest thing I'm going to say towards conservatives at this point. I want to share this account so that you see a worst case scenario or something close to a worst case scenario. 
and see how I made it through and realize there is a way to draw the level of ire that I did and still make your way through. So uh, yeah, long story short, I did my, make my way through. And so I've already said a couple of things to detract from my former bishop's uh, ministry and presence. I, I do want to acknowledge he could have hurt me more than he did. He could have been much more unfair, much more cruel, um, and I've heard of bishops behaving that way. And I want to acknowledge that Bishop Jimmy Nunn chose not to behave in such a way. Um, so even if I'm disappointed in the way that, that he behaved in some ways, I want to also acknowledge he could have been much worse. I want to also acknowledge uh, my, my annual conference could have had a much harsher disaffiliation plan. Um, people in, um, you know, I heard about Arkansas annual conference staff coordinating with stay UMC in local churches. To my knowledge, that really hasn't happened here except for one DS probably. Uh, it hasn't been nearly as common. It could have been much worse. I've heard of, you know, even in Mississippi where they have a somewhat friendly bishop, they still have to take their cross and flame off everything. They have to give all their hymnals back. Um, Oklahoma was much more amenable in many ways than most annual conferences to my knowledge. So as I offer this corrective, it's not they're the worst case scenario. They're, they're awful, awful, awful. I can acknowledge a lot of great stuff on the front end and be very grateful even as I lift up general concerns about how authority and power work in the United Methodist Church and why it's really fundamentally flawed. So I started the podcast. I had this clergy woman on, and we did talk about a topic particular to our former annual conference. She's also disaffiliated since. Um, and uh, we talked about how the conference did finance because the issue at hand was I was aware there were a couple annual conferences that had significant um, uh, reserves that they tapped into to cover the cost of disaffiliation for local churches, and I wanted to explore that here in Oklahoma. The problem was that we, at um, they now, have no transparent accounting for the conference. So they have, uh, 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 they get audited every year. They failed a few audits in a row first off, but when they finally did pass some audits, those audits did not include any kind of detailed information about the nature of the reserves, if they were designated or undesignated, how much that you could touch. They have nothing like a line item um, uh, report that they can give on all of their holdings and what they're designated for. And to be fair, a lot of annual conferences don't have that. But also to be clear, that's a problem because it's a conciliar government, uh, uh, ecclesiastical uh, ruling body that the United Methodist Church has. The annual conference is the primary body that makes these decisions, and then the staff is hired by the body to do the, the daily work that needs to take place. But essentially what's happened in the United Methodist Church is the same thing that's happened in the American government, which is they take the money – from the people in the pews or the, the common citizens, and then they create positions that then exercise confidentiality and secrecy and exclude the funders from the decision-making uh, by limiting the amount of information that they have, which I think is unconscionable. I, it offends me as an American that my government does that. It offended me as a United Methodist that, that little old ladies and wonderful people in my church were faithfully putting money in the plate here that then they were not given a clear picture of afterwards. They were able to see the yearly budget, a lot of mission and ministry that it went to. They weren't able to see the total picture. I wasn't able to see the total picture. So I talked about this with the clergy woman, and between her and me, we made a number of harsh statements about the annual conference uh, rebuffing us. The treasurer said he would not give the information. There were people we reached out to that would not um, respond even. Or, uh, you know, uh, I was part of the WCA, and we reached out for this information in several official capacities and uh, cited Oklahoma state law, and uh, they refused to give us this information, which I just think is really embarrassing for them. Um, so we talked about it, and um, apparently something hit a nerve because <laughs> I got a call uh, from my DS just a few days later saying that I had been summoned to the bishop's office and that I was to bring my credentials in hand. So um, this is obviously a power move because uh, you would bring these credentials in order to submit them uh, after being summarily dismissed. And according to the Book of Discipline, all local licensed pastors and el elders serve at the pleasure of the bishop. So the bishop 
according to the, the book that's in place, the covenant book in place, could easily readily dismiss me from service. And that's something I acknowledged as I, I went there. I, he was totally within his rights to dismiss me if he thought um, that I was no longer good for the annual conference. And to his credit, he didn't do that. But um, I wasn't given a lot of particulars on the front end uh, about why I was being summoned. I was just told to come. Uh, I did not ask if I could bring uh, a, a support, but I immediately called a board meeting at uh, my primary church, the Nowata uh, at the time, First United Methodist Church. And uh, the board was very concerned for me, but they were also clear that I had just spoken the truth. Um, and we had, the board chair wanted to go with me to this meeting. So he picked me up on the day of, and we drove to Oklahoma City, where the clergy woman that appeared with me also uh, had to be brought in as an individual uh, before the bishop. Uh, she was only in there five minutes. <laughs> so they called her in there first, um, and uh, uh, she was only in there five minutes, and she came out and just uh, told me, that they had given her an ultimatum to either apologize or turn in her credentials. And there was a timeline associated with that that wasn't very long. I don't recall it off the top of my head. And then I was summoned back, and uh, the, the DS tried to leave my board chair behind. By the way, I asked my board chair to sit down and do this with me as well, and, and he was reluctant um, for, for the same reasons that, that the clergywoman was. They, they just want to look forward. And I want to acknowledge it's really hard to talk about these things and not be petty and not be bitter. I'm actually not struggling right now. But um, the, for a lot of people, it would be hard to talk through these things. I just want to do it as a matter-of-fact thing to, to spread information <laughs> that's hopefully helpful for those who are going to speak truth to power and maybe get in trouble for it. So um, anyway, they tried to uh, leave my board chair in the lobby uh, but he refused. He says, uh, I'd, I'd really like to come, you know, let me talk to the bishop directly and uh, and we'll see if he lets me in. So the bishop met us at the door to his office and he said, uh, Jeffrey serves at my pleasure and uh, I'm going to oversee him and he has no right to, to any kind of friendly counsel being there at all. And uh, the, the board chair said, I, I represent the church. The church has commissioned me with this task we pay for this building. We pay for your salary. I think it's right to expect that I can come in. And the, the bishop was adamant I was to have nobody uh, there in support. So uh, my board chair was rebuffed. He spoke to this later uh, to the church as a whole. And it's because of the way that he reported the bishop speaking to him at that occasion that we got almost a 100% vote to disaffiliate. So the first piece of wisdom I would offer you is when you're having these conversations with the bishop, publicize, and if, you're, if the bishop is great and fair, publicize that. If the bishop is reluctant to engage in a good faith conversation and leans upon worldly power and prestige, then circulate that. Let the local church know. There are a lot of local churches that don't lean right, but they've decided they just don't like how the UMC does business. It's anecdotes like this that move a lot of people to understand these, these guys are all reading from the same playbook, and it's pretty nasty. Now, I just overstated that. There are some bishops that have behaved with integrity and fairness and have not been defensive in this way. Anyway, Bishop Nunn, <laughs> he rebuffed any kind of help. He wanted me alone in that room, and it wasn't just him. Uh, we had the assistant to the bishop, Joe Harris, who also once upon a time was thought of as a, a very faithful, conservative clergy. And so a lot of people have been very surprised at his um, reluctance to validate conservatives having a problem and wanting to leave. Um, in, in this meeting, I'll say I experienced Mr. Harris to be, um, Reverend Harris, to be very fair. Um, I, I really enjoyed his presence, to be honest with you. But also, I'm, I'm just disappointed that that things haven't gone differently for the Oklahoma Annual Conference. I don't understand how it is that Bishop Nunn and Reverend Harris and and other conservative leadership did not hold the line and have not insisted on the standards of faithful covenant observance. Um, if, if, 
If you're not familiar with it, John Lomparis has chronicled some of it, but there have been several infractions in the Oklahoma Annual Conference, flagrant violations of the Book of Discipline that have not been effectively prosecuted or, or met. The circumstances of that I can't speak to because it's all happened behind closed doors. However, there are clear covenant violators in the Oklahoma Annual Conference that the conference leadership has not addressed. So that's strike one. Strike two is bringing the hammer down on me and this other clergywoman uh, for raising good, valid points that should not be threatening to uh, an institution with integrity. You know, if that, and I said this in the, the conversation with the bishop, if they were handling the money in ways that are honorable and good, then they should be eager to show that to people. So the fact that they're not eager to show that to people and actually willing to be quite hostile to people who ask those questions publicly doesn't look good. And uh, if you imagine this is just the Oklahoma Annual Conference acting this way, I, I, I think you're silly. This is, this is uh, even GCFA. If you saw my interview with Jeff Pospisil, he's the new uh, chief financial officer sort of for the Global Methodist Church. He talks about how CFNA, uh, GCFA, uh, for the entire United Methodist denomination, the General Council on Finance and Administration, how it is that they obscure information by reporting a lot of irrelevant information or uh, flawed information. So this is this is endemic in the whole United Methodist Church. Oklahoma is not exceptional. Um, the exceptional uh, conferences are the ones that actually have some kind of transparent reporting. So I was looking at Rio, Texas and Central Texas yesterday. They actually have better reporting than Oklahoma in some ways. It's still substandard according to what I want, but as long as they're willing to give whatever is asked for to those who inquire, that's great. So I don't know if they do, but they should, because everybody should. In the local church, here's, here's the thing. In the local church, if someone wants to see an accounting of how we spend their money, there is no question. It's, it's right there. I mean, we have regular monthly financial reports that are given to the ad board that anybody can have. You know, there is no secrecy in how we spend our money. And if somebody wants to leave, then there is nothing, you know, this, I think the local church is a microcosm of how the, the general church should behave. So the general church should have transparent financial reporting. And if somebody wants to leave, there is no version of me going, well, you can only leave after you pay out what I say you owe, you know, so that that's the whole disaffiliation and uh, payout thing. I just think that's a helpful framework that for some reason, the institution just seems incapable of thinking about. Anyway, point of the story we're at is I'm finally brought into the room. There's a bishop, the assistant to the bishop. There's my district superintendent. Um, and then there's at least one other DS there who did not like me at all. And I, I don't need to say her name right now. She knows who she is. But um, she was hostile throughout the entire thing. She informed me about two-thirds of the way in that this was a confidential meeting. Uh, as I said, I recorded it, and I feel good about recording it, and I did not agree to it being a confidential meeting. Um, so uh, the reason I've, I've said that out loud a couple of times is if anybody decides to challenge my account of how this happened, then that's the point where I use the recording to <laughs> buttress what I say here. So I hope it doesn't get to that point. I'm not going to play any clips in this, uh, but that's just to make sure that, that I'm standing on the truth. So that's... Um, one of the other pieces of wisdom that I'm going to offer is uh, anytime that you're engaging in conversations with people in authority, get it either in writing or record it. There are some states, however, where it is illegal to record someone without their awareness, and that's really a problem. Um, Oklahoma is a one-party consent state, which means if, if you are party to the conversation, then as long as you consent to it, you can record whatever's going on. And that's honestly how I think it should be. Everybody ideally would be governed by the fact that there's a record in heaven of every thoughtless thing they say and do, but a lot of people really don't fear the Lord rightly. So if they're not going to fear the Lord, at least fear man. Uh, record what they're going to say so that it's potentially uh, handled either in a court of law or in a court of public opinion. And then that's just a general reminder to you as well. Don't say anything that you don't want to be brought up in a, a court of law, court of public opinion, or read aloud on the day of judgment. You know, there, there's a lot of scripture aiming at correcting us, warning us about how we use our words. And so that should rest very heavily upon 
everyone. It's resting heavily on me right now as I'm trying to speak quickly and succinctly, but also accurately. So there were at least four people in that room. I feel like there's another one right over here that I'm just not even thinking about. But if, if they were there, they just uh, they didn't figure in very heavily. As soon as we sat down, uh, the bishop informed me that I had the same deal as the clergy woman, that I had a certain short period to issue an apology. Otherwise, I would need to turn in my credentials. I should say, by the way, I didn't bring my credentials. I did not have them in hand. I left them at home. Would have been inconvenient. I didn't even look for them because uh, the whole thing felt icky to me. Uh, doing the song and dance in that particular way, stroking the bishop's ego, felt icky. So I didn't do it. If you saw my interview with Daniel Dennison, he was clergy at Asbury Church, the biggest United Methodist Church in uh, Oklahoma. It was in Tulsa. Sorry for my kids screaming in the backyard. Anyway, Daniel also got this whenever he started publicly talking about how the conference was not passing their audits. Uh, he got also called to the bishop's office with credentials in hand. Anyway, I sat down. I didn't have the credentials in hand. He didn't ask for them. It wasn't a thing. But he, he said I could either apologize or get out. And um, I, I decided to take a posture of just being amiable, you know, because my – here's another – I hope it's a nugget of wisdom. In the midst of a conflict, even if someone is behaving disagreeably, I think it's much more helpful to approach someone as someone who wants to be your friend. Uh, you're both willing the good of the other, and so you're wanting to cooperate. And so that's the kind of posture that I took, and it went really well. You know, as I said, the previous clergy woman, she was only in there for five minutes. I was in there for the better part of an hour uh, talking to the bishop. Um, so, you know, the, this is not word for word. I haven't even listened to the recording since we had it. And I, had, I have a buddy that I didn't listen to the recording, and he confirmed some of the things said. But I said, you know, I want to comply um, I'm hoping that you can help me understand a little bit more uh, around the infraction done and then a little bit more about what you want with an apology. And so that's the basic uh, conversation that took place from there. Uh, and it was weird. It, it felt the whole time like we were breaking a rule, like I really wasn't supposed to talk back. But because I was being uh, like that, the bishop was – half the time it felt like the bishop understood and appreciated what I said, and half the time it was like he didn't even understand what was going on. Of course, reading minds is impossible. I'm just making this from his face. But the dynamic in the room was really strange because the bishop was hostile at first, and then he kind of softened. And then my DS was there just kind of as a stalwart, uh, calm presence, non-anxious presence. And then Joe Harris was to my right, and he was, he was even smiling at me a couple of times. And then there was a very hostile DS who spoke up several times um, to, to make accusations and um, uh, bring an unpleasant presence into the, the room. Um, the, the two general conversations that, that happened were why it is that I was wrong to say what I said or ask the questions that I'm asking. And then secondarily, what it was that they wanted me to do. So the, the, the conversation about finance didn't go very far. I, I said the same thing to them that I've said here, that I've said in other venues, that it, it, it engenders suspicion and distrust whenever transparent reporting is not done. And it isn't that I'm alleging that they've done anything bad. It's that I'm highlighting the inevitable questions that get asked and the possibility for misbehavior if transparent reporting is not taking place. If you're familiar with um, – how audits work, it is possible to participate in bad financial practices and pass an audit. They're not reviewing every single receipt. They're, they're taking sample receipts. Uh, and so that, that means that there can be a lot of impropriety. Uh, through conversations with a number of people who had better connections than me, it was clear that the Oklahoma Annual Conference had mismanaged funds. I'm not saying that there was uh, anyone stealing uh, the money for personal gain. I'm saying that their record-keeping systems for how money was given, what it was designated for, where it was, uh, was not sufficient. There was great confusion. Well, for instance, all of a sudden there was a crisis five years ago about uh, the health insurance plan 
being un, unfunded. Supposedly, they had lost more than a million dollars each year in this plan, and they needed to radically change the plan and invent, uh, invest a lot more money in it. Well, according to the people who looked at these documents, the record keeping was so poor in it, it was never actually clear there was a crisis. So all of this drama that came up about it was based on accounting um, neglect. So um, there's that, there's, there's uh, the issue of wanting to redesignate uh, reserves that, that I was curious about. There was not being able to pass an audit. There's just so many signals along the way that the, the financial situation of the annual conference was negligent, and a lot of bad stuff could happen. Not only did they need to pass a new audit, they needed to just open up their finances for everybody. I still believe that. I still would call on the bishop and the treasurer and the annual conference to make such a decision. I, I just think you cannot... In this age where so many institutions and leaders have lost trust for good reason, it is not right or fair to say, don't you trust me? And what I said to them in this conversation is, if I ever have to say to my wife, don't you trust me, then that's a failure on my part as a husband. And so there, there is no good scenario where you guilt somebody for not trusting you. I mean, how many people have to get cheated on to learn? Trust really isn't a virtue. You know, trust, how many scriptures are there about vigilance, right? Uh, did Jesus, uh, who did not sin, did he trust us? No, he, he trusted us to kill him, but no, he didn't, he didn't trust us any further than he could have thrown somebody from the cross. You know, we're not trustworthy. Humans are not trustworthy. And this, this comes down to theology, right? If you have a correct anthropology, you understand that we're born in sin, inclined towards evil. And even after being uh, saved, even after being regenerated, that does not mean that we are immune to temptation. And in fact, institutions lose trust rightly whenever it's exposed that leadership gives in to temptation. So the only way to alleviate those fears is to bring things into the light, right? Anyway, I made the case pretty well. And there was, there was back and forth. And, um, you know, at one point, one of the things I love Joe Harris for is uh, I, I said, I hope I've made myself really clear. I hope you understand. And, and uh, Harris said, uh, yeah, yeah, we understand. But we hope you understand that even if we understand, that doesn't mean we agree. And I think that is an important thing in ministry. There have been a lot of people who felt like because I didn't agree with them, I hadn't listened to them. And you can listen to somebody and still disagree. I, I make room for that. I would like to know good reasons why it is they disagree. The only reason that the bishop listed in that conversation as to why it is that he was not going to reveal these finances for people at large is out of fear of litigation. That, that people are just litigious, and if it's revealed where the funds are, there are people that are prone to file suit. And so he wasn't going to invite that. I don't know why he thought that was um, a good explanation. I, it seems to me that lawsuits are more likely if there's obfuscation. So I, I don't know that that was a real reason. And again, I'm not going to pretend to be psychic, but it— it's hard for me to believe that that's the real reason. So the, the second part of that, if I forgot any, any analysis from that part, uh, I'll, I'll come back around to it. But the second part was, what do you want me to do? And I said, okay, so there's an apology that's in order. What do you imagine that that looks like? They hadn't gotten into any of the particulars of this apology with the previous clergywoman, and they were very surprised for me to ask for the particulars. I don't know if they thought I was just going to summarily quit because I was going to stand on virtue and I have nothing to apologize for, I quit. I don't know if it was that. I don't know what it was, but these guys were completely unprepared for me to ask for the particulars of this apology, which just seems crazy. I would think I was lying if I were you, but they, they were dumbfounded at this and they had no agreement about what this apology would look like, whether it be in person whether it be in writing, how many people it would be addressed to. And so they just start spitballing right there about they want. And at first it's, well, there should be face-to-face -face apologies. Uh, okay, I should apologize face-to-face. -face. Who should I apologize to? Well, mm, everybody in the conference office, you know. And, of course, the main person doing this is the very belligerent DS off to the side. <laughs> I'm kind of I'm, – I'm trying not to laugh. I mean, here I'm laughing. 
in there, I'm, I'm taking it very seriously. Okay, I'm supposed to apologize for their face. And okay, everybody in the conference staff. So I need to go desk to desk and say, I'm sorry for, and they're going, well, sorry for um, lying. Okay, what did I, what did I lie about? What, what did I say that wasn't accurate? And, well, you, you said, what, what did he say? You know, just, I mean, it's comical how unclear they were. It, it, what became very clear to me was, um, you ever get in a fight with somebody and it's just so petty and you realize, oh, the thing we're fighting about is not actually the thing we're fighting about. Um, that, that was kind of this. I really don't think, you know, in an uncharged environment, I don't think they would have taken issue with someone asking these questions. I think it's, it's already a tense situation. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you, I have no way to substantiate this. It was clear that one person in the room was offended, and it was because of the cultural climate. I think that the person who actually highlighted this and got me called into that room wasn't actually in the room. There's somebody very thin-skinned in high-up conference leadership. Uh, I used to – he and I actually used to talk and kind of be friendly. He was interested in how I thought through ministry. He wanted to kind of help me fund a, a local ministry with some poor people. But there were different things I saw being done on a conference level that I just I wanted to let him know that I saw and I was concerned about. And he eventually wrote me and said, it seems like you're just really interested in uh, insulting me and the conference leadership, and I, I don't know what I ever did to offend you. And I had not come to him on that wavelength. And so it became clear to me that any sort of critique that this guy gets was immediately internalized and taken very personally. So whenever on the internet we're saying – the the things that this annual conference is doing so far as their fiscal exercise are not responsible and raise uh, suspicions, that I'm pretty sure it's that guy who came to the bishop and said, this must be punished. Call this guy in. He needs to be fired. I suspect he wanted my job, and then my I, I created this whole scenario in my head, but I suspect the bishop was like, well, I'll call him in and put him in a position uh, where he, he probably quits or something. And then... I, I don't – I have no way of reading their heads, but it did seem abundantly clear I did not behave in a way that they anticipated, that I was much more comfortable in that environment than they wanted me to be, um, and that they did not want to react as defensively as that one DS did. So she's going through uh, – he should go desk to desk, and he should apologize for lying. And, and, and I turned it into an opportunity to say – this is just something that concerns me. I, I wonder how much you guys are getting into the, at the point, the word misinformation was getting thrown around a lot. And I said, uh, are you guys concerned about misinformation? And she, yes, very much. You know, Rob Renfro and his ilk are constantly spreading lies. And I said, you know, this is, this is the thing that's frustrating in this present moment. You're responding so defensively to lies, but you can't substantiate them. Are you aware of any lies that Rob Renfro, good news, the IRD, anyone has spread from... Any kind of leadership, and once again, got nothing. So I, it, it was embarrassing for them. I was embarrassed for them. I was also kind of gleeful as we're going through. Well, you know, logistically, it's not feasible for him to go desk to desk. Okay, so do I need to drive down next week, the week after? And then finally, uh, the bishop says, well, we have a staff meeting next week, and uh, we'll just put it to the entire staff. How, how do they want you to apologize to them? For this, what became clear in the aftermath of this was hardly anyone was offended by me and the conference staff because um, what they eventually decided in this meeting was it's really not necessary for an in-person thing uh, we should think about in writing. So we cut off the meeting actually without the particulars of that being listed out because they were very not clear on that. So uh, we cut off the meeting. I thanked them for their time. We, uh, I think we did pray together, uh, even though that felt phony. Uh, but, you know, I got out, got in the car with uh, my board chair, who uh, uh, was, was happy to get my report. That was so weird. Uh, and, and took his own report back to the church, and the rest is history there. But with respect to my trouble with the bishop and the conference staff, my DS did eventually follow up with me a day or two later with instructions as to this apology and what it was supposed to look like. And um, uh, some of it was was silly. You know, the particulars of it are I don't remember, but I was clear that I could not lose my integrity 
in this. I couldn't lie to keep my job and I couldn't be a people pleaser. And so I, I remember parts of it made me uncomfortable and then parts of it were fine. And then they gave me individuals to whom I needed to write to extend these apologies. So um, I ended up eventually writing. Oh, I remember <laughs> in the meeting with the bishop, um, we were talking about me writing these things up. And I said, okay, so I'll write these things up. And he interrupted me and said, and when I read these, I will read your heart. And if I think you're lying, I will fire you anyway. <laughs> Which I just thought was so crazy that anyone would even say, but he said it. Um, so anyway, I wrote up uh, these drafts that then they, they were, they were kind enough to let the clergy woman that also got in trouble with me use these drafts uh, as well. She tinkered with them a little bit, but uh, I ended up saying things along the lines of, I don't, I don't question your intentions. I just, I was raising questions that I, I hoped wouldn't reflect on you personally or professionally. And, and I really regret that it, it caused any kind of anguish or, um, I had no intention of personally affronting you, which actually is true. You know, I, I do, I do have concerns about the character, character and professional performance of a number of these people. However, in the context of that moment, I wasn't speaking to that. I was speaking to a larger issue that I think they were wrong to take as personally as they did or um, react to that defensively. It, in my head, righteous people would have responded with, here's the finances. We have nothing to hide. I don't understand why that would be a fictitious thing to hope for outside of they have neglected their fiscal duties, their fiduciary duties, and they don't want it to be exposed. It, it, the only other one is we just don't do things that way, which is not – that's not a valid position to hold. That's not an intelligent or conscientious position to hold. That's a ridiculous, reactionary, regressive, deserving of – the destruction the UMC is seeing response. So anyway, I drafted these. They came short of what was asked. They were received. I kept my job, um, and I was able to see my churches through the disaffiliation process. Now, could have gone very differently for me. Um, I could have been summarily fired. Um, they could have chosen to take issue with what I had submitted in writing and, and fired me, and then we could have done this whole song and dance of the church trying to hire me as some kind of interim pastor and doing something to block any kind of uh, new appointment and keep me and my wife and kids in the parsonage. And we were having those kind of conversations and, and I, was, I was getting advice from different angles. I, I'm very glad we didn't have to go through that. We could have afforded it. It would have been very stressful and icky. So uh, it went the way that it went. It, it, I used the word the phrase worst case scenario earlier. That part of it was not a worst case scenario. The the thing that I think a lot of people are concerned about is what happens when I get called into the bishop's office. And so I've already talked about a lot of the lessons that I learned. Record everything. Get things in writing. Um, something else that I think is is really core and key. And you get this in your pastoral training a lot of the time. Using the Rogerian method is really helpful. And if you don't know what that is, that's repeating pe to people back to them what you have heard them say in your own words. And so a big thing that worked well in that meeting was just me saying back to the bishop and these DSs what I heard them say in ways that, I mean, if you make them sound ridiculous, it's just going to go poorly. But if it's, okay, here's the thing that I've heard you say, help me, help me make sense out of this more. Then they were just falling all over themselves to try and make it. I mean, that was a good 20 minutes of our conversation was just them trying to spitball these plans for how it should look. Um, when you put uh, – what was exposed in that meeting was the fact that they're not used to thinking critically or being questioned um, and the fact that, that they just are not critically engaging complicated issues. You know, I think – What's being exposed in the United Methodist Church broadly is these people in leadership who've been brought up in the church, they are not able to even distinguish between the institution and the church of Jesus Christ. It's a foregone – these two things cannot be separate to them. They cannot conceive of a world in which this institution actually betrays the heritage of Jesus Christ. And because of that, they are enslaved to something that is compromising them spiritually. 
Um, all of this is connected in how they bully, and I use that word intentionally, bully a local licensed pastor. Um, yeah, I didn't address that that started this. I was not an ordained elder at this point. I never was. I didn't make it through the ordination process. If you haven't read my sub stack, I, I had a, a, a report on that. But a local licensed pastor can be summarily fired easily without any kind of trial. Um, I was in a more vulnerable position position than a lot of clergy are who who I would say all of you are are morally uh, obligated to speak truth to power. Very few choose to do it in a public way, online, in a confrontational way, in person. And I am exhorting you. I've already rebuked you. Now I'm exhorting you to get the courage and boldness now that you have lacked until now. And there are a lot of people going to react defensively to that. I've done everything I can. Um, I, I would just direct you to the Bitter Medicine series. If, if conservatives had acted with integrity and boldness and bravery all the way along, I just don't think there's any way that the UMC would have gotten where it got. So I think it's a failure of the leadership that was in place. And I say that I love a lot of the leadership that was in place. I, I I admire them, but it was a failure of their leadership that resulted in things getting here. And unless we learn to be more vigilant, more bold and forceful in our ministry in the global Methodist church, the exact same thing is going to happen because what's required is not just boldness and courage, but a willingness to be seen as mean. Uh, and that's, that's, that's been inimical, uh, uh, unacceptable to Methodists who want to be seen as nice and affable and reasonable. So anyway, there are, I mean, I just got done saying be affable and reasonable in these group scenarios. I didn't have to get mean. If I had gotten mean, I probably would have gotten fired. You know, I, God made a way, despite me saying things online. It's funny, the other thing the bishop said, <laughs> he said, I didn't, I didn't watch the whole video in which I'd said this. I didn't watch the whole video. I watched five minutes and I was done. And I said, did, did you see anything in those five minutes that you found reprehensible? He's, I just didn't like the spirit of it. That's not a direct quote. But I just thought it was so weird. The bishop would call me into his office for something he hadn't even seen or heard. Isn't that crazy? I just think that's, I don't, there is no world in which that is responsible leadership. If you're going to ask somebody to drive round trip Four, between four and five hours to come and get reprimanded over something you haven't even seen or listened to. It just, one of the theories on Bishop Nunn is that he's actually not in charge. He's just being told what to do by somebody. And that sort of thing suggests that. Somebody told him to call me into his office and threaten him, threaten him and he just did that. So I, I don't know. Bishop Nunn, if you want to put out a corrective, if you want to reach out to me personally, explain, you don't know anything to me. But the whole thing has just been so mysterious and weird. And I'm glad to be free of it. You know, I'm probably not going to talk about it again unless somebody challenges me on it. Um, you know, is that all I wanted to say here? I wanted, I wanted to exhort conservatives to speak boldly and not be afraid of the powers that be. I rebuked you. I exhorted you. I told you my own personal story. What more can I say than to you I have already said? Um, there's probably a lot of things, but that's, that's the long and short of it. God made a way for me. There are a lot of people for whom God doesn't make a way for. Oh, I, there's a pastor just got removed from his position in uh, North Georgia. His church took a vote, and there was a lot of conference intervention. The vote failed by just a couple and then he was uh, dismissed and alienated, and now he's a GMC pastor. That sort of stuff happens too, you know, and I, I think you have to put your trust in God. You also have to understand the momentum is in favor of the global Methodist church, so even if you get kicked out, you lose your stuff, you're, you're, the, the global Methodist church wants bold leadership. They want somebody like you who's willing to speak truth even at the cost of a paycheck, um, and if they don't want people like that, then they're probably not the right answer to the UMC. Whether or not the GMC wants that kind of leadership, God deserves that kind of leadership. He deserves those kinds of shepherds that are not cowed by the wolves, that, that, um, that are willing to take one for the team. And so if you haven't been until now, I hope, I hope listening to this makes you take courage or at least reconsider your posture. Um, 
And then zooming out back to the plain spoken thing, the the presupposition I've carried with me all the way along is that injustice, corruption, immorality is it thrives in darkness. And so my mission has just been to bring things into the light. My theory has been that whenever you speak openly and honestly and earnestly about the the nasty underbelly of the United Methodist Church, that that helps local churches and pastors make sober and good long-term decisions about their covenant affiliation. And it also offers a course corrective for those who are going to continue to be invested in the United Methodist Church. So I'd read... I direct you to the Lonnie Brooks interview I just put out. He is someone he's going to stay connected and in leadership in the United Methodist Church, and he's using that to help improve the United Methodist Church, to renounce the, the corrupt ways of the past and to promote new measures that restore the integrity of the United Methodist Church. If you ask me what would happen in a perfect world from here, it's not that the United Methodist Church would crash and burn. It's that the United Methodist Church would repent, would bring everything into the light, and establish a new culture of integrity, transparency, and fidelity um, to not just the clear meaning of the Bible, which is essential, but also the clear meaning of what we have collaboratively, we, now you, have collaboratively decided. Um, a lot of things have gone wrong. Half of making them right is naming what went wrong and then doing right. So I've chosen to do that within the Global Methodist Church right now. A lot of you have as well. Um, if we imagine that the Global Methodist Church is going to be pure and perfect and not do re recreate any of this stupid stuff, I think that's naive. I think we have to be prepared for people to take authority who do not wear the mantle respectably. And, and we need to be clear about having lots of points of uh, con not conflict, but confrontation uh, when there is bad leadership. For those of you within the United Methodist Church, you have to decide from here on out, are you just going to keep your head down and try and grit your teeth and, and bear it? Or are you going to step up and be a bold witness, even in this time where they think that they've just uh, chased all the bad ones out and then intimidated the rest of the ones that have stayed in? Or are you going to continue to to beat the drum of the truth? The truth matters. So um, anyway, I, I think that's about all I've got to say. I'll probably remember like 40 other things I wanted to say in this later, but I talked long enough. Um, anyway, if you've, if you've got your own experiences like this that you'd like to share, I would love to be a platform for that. So uh, you can email me at plainspokenpod at gmail.com. You can comment uh, on this wherever you've seen or heard it. And uh, I would just encourage you to be in prayer. I, I don't think I need your prayers with respect to this particular thing, but I think there are a lot of clergy that this is an inflection point where they're needing to decide if they're going to be, if they're going to act with more boldness and integrity than they have. So, if you're not a, a pastor, pray for your pastor that, that he or she has that boldness and integrity. If you are a pastor who hasn't had that, then just bring this to the Lord. Uh, a lot of people are going to watch this and go, he is so inappropriate, and he's just so full of himself. He thinks he has it all figured out. And uh, I would encourage you to be more charitable than that and entertain the possibility that I, I might um, have a good impact on the conversation here. And maybe even you're called to to re-examine the posture that you've taken. So regardless of whether or not you do that, I, I just really appreciate all the uh, support and engagement that I get. I, I just think if, if we're going to be the movement of God that, that he deserves, then we have to conscientiously in, intentionally have these conversations publicly um, and invite people generally into it. How on earth are we going to have a capable lay-led movement if the laity aren't invited to think through and talk through these things. So uh, that'll be my last reflection. Thanks for joining me. Thanks. Uh, uh, if you want to support me, you can go to Locals, my Locals community uh, uh, online. It, plain Spoken is what it's called. And then just, you know, keep me in the loop with stuff y'all think I should be talking about, praying about. God bless you, your church, your ministry. I'll see you later.